Okay, hi everybody. Let me greet you from Chicago, from where I made this remote presentation. And I'm very grateful to organizers of the conference, the delegates who gave me an opportunity to deliver my remote, uh, my remote presentation. And I, okay, and I'm going to enjoy my presence, remote presence here as much as I did show it in the previous conferences organized by Ali. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Well, let's get started. So, this is the east of my club. I don't have a pick, sorry about that. And uh, let's move on. The real wish of the Ayyar discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. This is the quotation from the famous writer of the post. And my another dedication is to Vitaly Ginsburg. I dedicate this contribution to Vitaly Ginsburg's work in grateful memory of his great personality, his time and encouragement, and his generous help in making my way into physics. Now let's get started. Now we start with a bit of the history. Supercomputer was discovered by Cameron on the satellite more than 100 years ago, and he was actually the only owner of it here at the time, and therefore he was thinking of making experiments at very low temperatures. And first of all, he decided to check the behavior of the conductivity of metals at very low temperature. The rule formula was very well known at the time, and actually what he expected was the fall with the decrease of the temperature, the scattering time should have increased and therefore the conductivity should grow. But then what he expected, Hamilton, was that at very low temperatures, the carriers, free electrons, the carriers of conductivity should freeze out and then the density drops and the resistivity must start growing again. But what he observed in reality was somewhat different. He observed a zero resistance state in the liquid mercury on which he conducted his beautiful and famous experiment, and the resistance dropped exactly to zero. Cameron Bones was an outstanding physicist. He immediately realized the meaning of this discovery he has made. And he called this phenomenon he observed superconductivity and immediately wrote to report to the Netherlands Royal Society. This was the start of new evolutionary physics. The new breakthrough in superconductivity has been done only 22 years after its discovery. Walter Meissner and Robert Oxenfeld made a beautiful experiment and they found out that one applies magnetic field to superconductors, this magnetic field gets expelled from a superconductor, then it destroys superconductor if sufficiently hot. This was called Meissner effect, and then Fritz London made a beautiful next step. He assumed, and I will tell about this a little bit later in the world, that actually the superconducting state is a quantum state, he immediately derived the very famous expression for the superconducting current, and the next step was done a few years later by Ginsburg and Landau, who wrote the remarkable paper and the remarkable Ginsburg Landau equation. Actually, they were quite important. They stated that paper that London's theory, despite successfully describing several aspects of electrodynamics to superconductors, can help determine the surface energy at the normal superconducting phase interface. Moreover, the London's theory didn't describe the destruction of superconductivity by currents and magnetic fields, and as they claim they wrote this paper just to correct this small, let's say, 
forms of the London's theory, but the meaning of the theory and its outcome outpaced this modest claim. Basically, what they made, they used concept Landau concept of phase transitions and the other parameter, and they identified this other parameter with the wave function of microscopic superconductor introduced by Fritz London, and very making variation with respect to this amplitude of this other parameter, they immediately obtained what we now call this Landau equation with the probe boundary conditions at the border of the superconductor and respecting this with respect to the reactor potential, they immediately obtained what was called the London equation for the superconducting time. And they identified basically the amplitude of the other parameter with the density of the superconducting electrons at zero temperature. The next the outstanding step has been done by Abel Kostov, who solved the Ginsburg-Landau equation and actually tried to explain the experiment, the Palais-Zvalitsky experiment, on the mixed, or mixed, this concept didn't exist at the time, on the same uh, superconductors, and he explored the possibility of creating positive energy, that the negative energy at the boundary between superconductor and normal state, and he immediately described the experimental data. His next step was published in 1957. This was the discovery of what we call the precursor lattice now, and he described, actually he introduced this notion of type two superconductors, basically in this work, and now, we know his work that in type 2 superconductors, the magnetic field can penetrate in the form of a thin filament, filaments of the magnetic field, and these filaments make what we call now a precursor and they make a mixture of normal and superconducting states. Now we call it a precursor state, this explained the Schumann experiment, who actually discovered this mixed state. And there are points where, singular points, where this amplitude of the other parameter is zero. And in the vicinity of the zero, we could prepare current, currents in circle with zeros. And actually, the superconducting currents may take this slot out of the superconducting currents. And the next groundbreaking discovery what was the discovery? Of high temperature activity by actually to be that high. And the next step, what we will try to do, we'll try to understand the origin of superconductivity in simple, very simple terms. And then Okay, make clear why we can expect superconductivity even at room temperature. So basically we have a lot of courses of superconductivity, careful and beautiful, but what we will try to do to understand superconductivity in one line. Basically in one line. What we use is a beautiful free London concept that superconductivity is a microscopic human quantum state and use, okay, the notion that superconductivity therefore should be defined by a parameter which is nothing but the wave function of the condensate, superconducting, as we know, superconducting condensate, and then use uncertain principle, or a certain uncertain principle, which actually relates the uncertainty in the phase and uncertainty in the number of the particles, meaning the uncertainty in the amplitude of the parameter. Since we know from the Meissner effect that the phase is actually well defined across the system and it's basically a constant, the uncertainty in the phase is zero. It immediately means that uncertainty in the number of the particles 
is infinite. They can fluctuate whatever they are. But then it means that particles that comprise condensate cannot scatter and dissipate energy because every scattering grammar can be viewed as a magnet and it gives us an opportunity to count the particles, which is not possible. And therefore, scattering is not possible. We should have infinite conductance. This is understanding of conductivity as promised in Pablo. Now, of course, it will be very interesting to check what we can get out of this, our understanding of super conductivity. And we had an experimental motivation for next study, and this experimental motivation was the discovery that the same superconducting field actually form a granular structure, superconducting grounds connected to each other. So this was the experiment, I gave just an experimental picture, and the model which we tried to consider was a little bit easier than the model of the long-range Coulomb interaction. It was the model of a superconducting field which is connected elastically to the substrate, and therefore we have long-range elastic interactions between different points of superconductor. So the basic part of the model was, was this modern Dow equation, giving the free energy of superconductor and the linear elasticity theory. And what was immediately obtained that the superconductor superconducting behavior, superconducting structure in this same field elastically connected to the substrate is actually a granular superconductivity. And the ginsburg landau equation was modified. Let me show you it. It's here. So the basic change was the change in this fundamental parameter in the Ginsburg-Landau equation, which actually converted Ginsburg-Landau equation into a non-local one, because different points are connected to each other by this non-local uh, long-range elastic interaction. Strictly speaking, this means that basically the Ginsburg-Landau equation, which must be local, does not apply to this granular superconductivity, and this granular superconductivity, which we observe by empirical stimulations, cannot be obtained and described by Ginsburg Landau theory. Therefore, we claim basically that we discovered a new kind of superconductivity, which is a granular superconductivity. And the next step in understanding of the origin of this granular superconductivity, which apparently they have this uh, topological origin was made using the, well, basically the way of presentation of physics introduced by one of the greatest physicists of past last century, Emil Noether, who actually introduced all the symmetry considerations into the physics and described how all the physical laws fall from the symmetric consideration. The next step using a miniature approach was made by Shao and Wen, who introduced excitations of the topological ground states, which are supposed to be described in his model by the conserved metro currents, actually conserved charge and conserved vortex currents. This immediately gave an opportunity to construct the proper action which took into the account the important long distance interaction, a role of long casual interaction, and this immediately brought the new understanding of granular superconductivity and all the phenomena which happened in the granular superconductor. Basically, the approach was based on the remarkable work of my collaborators who introduced the technique by which gauge theory of general semiconductors can be constructed. And now we just summarize the logical theory of superconductivity very fast. Basically, what can be done 
using a minimal approach, is to exercise and explore full electric magnetic quantum duality of full symmetry between electric and magnetic phenomena. Actually, there is a duality between models, not vortices, but magnetic models and Cooper pairs. And then there is a duality between monopole and Cooper pair and the which we developed in our paper we cited. And this gave us an opportunity to, to describe all the phases which can appear in thin superconducting fields which experience superconductor consolidated transition. Mm -hmm. This should have a deep ground power structure. And this ground power structure is defined by topological effect arising from the presence of two quantum other condensed monopoles and condensed cooperators. Okay, I just briefly remind you where these monopoles appear because as soon as we try to establish the full duality between electric and magnetic phenomena. It works pretty well in a, let's say, vacuum, but it doesn't want to work in condensed matter unless we introduce magnetic elementary particles, marbles, actually, Paul Dirk was first to introduce them, so we call it Dirk marbles now. And then we can construct the action describing these models and see that indeed all the physics of superconductors is, can be very well described in the framework of this model. So it's just a brief summary of what we can do. But the most important step which we can make, we can understand where actually energy can come from. And basically, we can establish that the pair of the electrons into other pairs can appear as the result of a beautiful mathematical theorem. Actually, this theorem, one of the most mathematical theorems of the 20th century, was introduced by famous, well, outstanding mathematician Arnold. And this, his theorem claimed and established that if we have a restricted system, then all the divergences vector fields make a restricted volume formation, which is called hot fibration or hot fields, which actually make self-linked configuration. And if we apply this concept to superconductivity, we immediately realize, following the final consideration, that the long distance interaction coming from the arrow of one Kasher effect provides this Gaussian linking, Arnold's Gaussian linking, and results in what we call now churn sign inspection. And we can immediately introduce the pairing mechanism. This pairing mechanism appears because of the monopoles which should appear in between two conducting planes. And what is remarkable about this pairing mechanism is that the only energy parameter which comes in is the Fermi energy of electrons. And it means that basically transition temperature, well, first of all, transition to uh, the temperature which we prepare for, and then the transition superconducting temperature can be actually much higher than it was believed. Before. So this is real space monopole pairing mechanism, and it implies, I repeat, that the only energy parameter defined on this superconducting temperature is for energy. And since we achieved the full understanding of what is going on, and that this okay, Aron von Asher plays an important role in everything what is happening. We can now go to the experiment, but before we make a footnote, that this monopole pairing mechanism actually explains all the puzzles, properties of high temperature superconductivity and the related pseudo gap state. 
which was a puzzle since the spell of brain of Tartemisius of Kinetity. Now let's go to our experiment. This is our dedication and the figures borrowed from this great, beautiful, beautiful Faust. And basically, it says that the theory by itself is dry and null, but what is beautiful is every green, every green, let's say, tree of the experiment. So you see, the evergreen life tree. And now we start with our experiment. First, we mentioned the preceding experiments, which has been done mostly in our collaborator, Yakov Kapilevich's group. And those were beautiful experiments which actually have established the existence of the local superconductivity in graphite sample, samples, even at room temperatures. So those are magnetization history loops measured in the case when magnetic field is perpendicular to the graphite planes. And these measurements are beautifully, beautifully, beautifully compared by the measurements obtained on a usual piece of superconductor, which is also, also having a large structure, and the very remarkable effect which immediately indicates that this superconductive activity is of a local uh, nature, observing it must be multiplied by a factor of 2,000 so that the data became compatible. The next preceding experiment also was done on the graphite, graphite sulfur. Composite samples, the mixture of the graphite powder and the salt powder, and again you can see the difference between uh, field cold magnetization data and zero field cold magnetization data, which show indeed that we do have superconductivity. And it even Indeed, at high temperatures, once again, the same was that if we change, for example, the magnetic field, we can see that this graphite, this local superconductivity of graphite disappears, and basically we can observe what can observe, or what one observe is basically the transition from the this mortal superconductivity will get insert. And this is the case of the repetition of a similar experiment in terms of the resistance. And basically the fact that the resistance is not going to zero even in the absence of the magnetic field indicates that this superconductivity is local and for that the contribution of the normal phase is noticeable. And this is the experiment which actually shows that this uh, local superconductivity is related to the wrinkles. And this data were, were, were basically confirmed by further measurements. Okay, so this is again enlarged, enlarged data showing the transition from like superconductivity in the wrinkles to the insulating behavior. And as we increase the magnetic field, and then there were local measurements which finally identified that this local superconductivity is indeed to the, to the wrinkles. Now we make our decisive step, which I, I love to describe, which is we do experiments showing the global superconductivity. So, okay, in this slide I show the schematic picture showing how the cleaved 
graphite samples are prepared, so we have the adhesive tape, then this adhesive tape will remove the upper layers of, uh, of graphite, and then the local wrinkles form, and this is the configuration of a single ring. Uh, wrinkle. Well, and this is the scheme of the experiment, so this, those are, okay, those are the uh, schematic sketch of the electrodes, these bars, and those are schematic sketch of the wrinkles going along the samples, and this is the STM picture of these wrinkles, and this is the scheme of the measurements. So we actually measure the global time between the first and the last picture, and we make, okay, sorry, and we make measurements of the local voltages between, for example, 10th and 11th electrodes, and actually also between different other electrodes. And this is basically key. So, let's okay. First, again, we repeat our okay, scanning electron microscope image of the the graphite surface. This is the sketch of the experiment, and this is our data. This is semi logarithmic IV plots, and measurements are taken at room temperature, and we clearly see the superconducting transition. And what we see that the critical time for this superconducting transition. <coughs> actually changes and drops as it's supposed to do when we increase the magnetic light magnetic field. This is just the exemplary IV, IV curve showing the superconductive behavior pretty similar to what we see in the superconductors, but in a, now in a graphite sample and at room temperatures, this global superconductor which was never seen before. And those are selected IV characteristics measured in a zero magnetic field. And what we see that the critical current decreases with increasing temperature, which is absolutely normal, and this is what we expect. But what we immediately see when we repeat this measurement set finally magnetic field that should have that now the critical current increases with the increase in temperature, which is was first a little bit unusual and unexpected. Then okay, this is the measurements. Again, this is measurements summarizing our results. So this is the critical current dependence upon the applied magnetic field in this A town, which shows that there is some critical point which connects or separates the region where critical current decreases with the increase in magnetic field uh, or temperature from the region when it decreases, increases. Then there is a con comparison between our data applied that we measured in graphite with the usual superconducting data on the usual superconductor, and you can see the immediate similarity between them. And what is beautiful is that basically this curve is described by the model for the superconductor, ferromagnetic superconducting Josephson junction. And then again in the Panel C, we show the, this behavior of the critical current as function of temperature for these two regions. And what we finally represent, our experimental measurements, is the connection between the critical current and the inverse normal resistance, which is exactly the connection which we do have in the Josephson junction. And what is remarkable? that this resistance is the normal resistance of a bulk graphite cell. And another remarkable, remarkable observation we make is that there exists a metastable state actually at half voltage or half normal resistance as we see in the next slide, 
despite the resentment they will state, which appears in different kinds. And then we can see that indeed this like a resistance follows this expected Joseph's injunction here uh, relations and the expected dependence on the temperature. And now what we see the remarkable thing that basically at this metastable state the resistance is exactly the half of the resistance of the normal resistance which appears as soon as our superconducting behavior disappears. And this is a very interesting observation, which we explain a little bit later. And, okay, so this is the demonstration of this metastable state, half of this normal resistance, which appears in both temperature dependence and magnetic field dependence of the resistance. And this is another beautiful experimental observation, the oscillations of the difference in the zero field code and field code uh, organizations, which exactly follows the theoretical descriptions obtained for this superconductor, ferromagnetic superconductor, which is And this is the final thing, the history of groups which actually I've shown and we observed in this sample. And this immediately gives us the estimate of the okay, that this superconductivity is indeed is related to the wrinkles, because only a small part of the volume becomes superconductive. And now we can come up in that simple theory based on our gauge approach, which immediately explains the behavior. Um, of our observed resistance and observed behavior of the critical kind. So we immediately remember that simple elastic strain model shows that superconductivity becomes actually grammar to see that we introduce strain graded fluctuations and show that they lead in the superconductivity we model grade boundaries as a gradient of a shear strain into the two sides of the boundary. And then we introduce immediately the effective gauge field related to the strain. This is a standard, more or less standard relation. Okay, so sorry. It disappears. Okay, L is the latest constant. We have a numerical factor, some numerical factor, energy constant, and the strain tensor. And then the only, okay, the only strain gradients represent effective gauge and variant combinations which are coupled to the equations. And we consider the uh, layers of graphite with the same pure strain, which is function of the, let's say, coordinate perpendicular to our wrinkles. Then we have unique non vanishing gauge component and the specific model for the strain is given here. It's just a simple model, which very well okay, modulates the behavior of strain, of strain in the wrinkle, and then we immediately obtain effective magnetic field, which is related to the wrinkle, and which is felt by electrons, and which is actually directly along the z direction, main perpendicular to the graphite plates. This is the final formula here, this list. And then we can make this, the usual answers to see indeed that this, okay, this, our solutions are restricted to the wrinkle for the strain, and we can compose the usual power of the for our description and find the ground state of this Newtonian and find that out, okay, out uh, of the line of this magnetic field basically disappears and the channel is only within this line of effect. And what we can do next 
we can remember that actually we do have modulations along this ring or along our one of a uh, one dimensional system as well. And what we finalize each, we we uh, we formulate our gauge action for the effective gauge fields following this then in our own approach and then we find the potential which two electrons this total potential which two electrons feel which are these two electrons which are actually located in the wrinkle and we can immediately see that the presence of this churn science long distance term immediately results in formation of the bubble state, which means nothing but repairs due to churn science induced magnetic moments of the electrons. And this is our main conclusion of our theoretical consideration that we do have Cooper pair at our wrinkles indeed then we can continue with this, our consideration and show indeed, as soon as we have connection between superconducting grounds along the ring strong enough, we immediately see superconductivity which forms because of the instant cons, there is an instant cost in this tower of this transition, which separate one who sleeps that it may destroy superconductivity in one dimensional system. Basically, this consideration was first given by Jakob Cohen in his old classical paper. And then we come to the conclusion that at zero temperature, superconductivity emerged in these one dimensional systems associated with our ideas. Then, what we can do, we can immediately generalize our approach to the final temperature, and then see that basically phase slips are also suppressed at final temperatures, and this occurs because this phase slips, which should appear seemingly only in a surface layer of graphite, actually continue into the bulk graphite material, into the normal uh, bulk graphite materials, and the motion of the vortex is immediately suppressed by the normal resistance. And this suppresses phase slips, which can destroy superconductivity in the wrinkle. And this means that superconductivity in the wrinkles also appears due to stabilizing effect due to interaction of the, these vortices with the bulk material, where they, this stabilizing effect of this bulk graphite guarantees that superconducting state survives at room temperature. And the last notion which we can make is that we can see more carefully the, the model for the electrons which appear in the ring we immediately find, find that those that P waves there and therefore in this case half quantum vortices do exist and their contribution into observed resistant behavior immediately results in the appearance of the observed metastable state causing the resistance plateau at resistance by half just because these vortices which contribute to this effect are not full quantum but half quantum vortices so this completely explains our experimental observation now we come Movements, which is summarized the report global room temperature superconductivity in the cleaved highly oriented pyrepyrite and graphite carrying dense arrays of nearly parallel surface line effects. Multi terminal rings at the ambient pressure, so basically normal conditions, and the temperature interval between 4.5 Kelvin and room temperature and magnetic field between 0 and 9 Tesla perpendicular to the basal perfect planes reveal that the superconductive critical problem is governed by the inverse normal state resistance. 
which is basically indeed characteristic for this superconductor ferromagnetic uh, or just superconductor, uh, okay, Joseph, 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 some Josephson structures, basically the magnetization measurements of superconducting screen and history group with the critical current installations with temperature characteristic for superconductor ferromagnetic. Superconductor provides strong strong support for occurrence of superconductivity at temperatures even exceeding room temperature and indicate that we should have superconductor ferromagnetic superconductor Josephson junctions. And we develop a theory of low superconductivity in a, a array of limited effects and demonstrate that it arises in lower phase areas, superconducting grounds in effects due to stabilizing effects all of the underlying perimeter of the volume. So those are conclusions. And this is yet not another conclusions. We will use quotation from this. Well, the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, that science develops not biological transitions from one from an established fact to other, equally reliable derived from them, and the new science emerges as guesses based on analogous and experimental observations, and not at all as rigorous proofs, usually appearing much later than the discoveries that have to be with them. And thank you very much for your kind attention. And now I'm ready for your questions, please. Do you have any questions? Sorry? Yes, I can hear, just I can't can discriminate between the words, so maybe. Oh? Okay, no questions. Thank you for the uh, yes. speak. Okay. Thanks to the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Are we done? Thank you very much again for your like beautiful and kind attention and I really enjoyed it okay. Be present remotely present here. Thank you. Okay, I'm inviting last speaker, the speaker, John Miller from the uh, University of Utah, uh, United States, uh, to talk about uh, organic-based magnets, new magnetic materials.